uh, honorable chairpersons, respected seniors and dear friends, my topic today is a story of two brothers with a sinister alliance. And the only disclosure here that I would like to make is given a chance, I would be proud to shoot them in an encounter. Because they are not only brothers in arms, but they are also partners in crime. If you look at the prevalence of hypertension, it's almost 40%, 20 to 40% at diagnosis of type 1, whereas it is 50% in type 2, and it jumps up to more than 90% in patients with albuminuria. Look at more than 90% of the patients with diabetes are going to have hypertension. And this sinister alliance between diabetes and hypertension, if you can see, a person who is hypertensive has 2.4 times the chance of becoming a diabetic, whereas a person who has diabetes has twice the chance of becoming a hypertensive. And the biggest, commonest denominator is disease of the vascular tree. Now, if you look at the trajectories, both development and hypertension and diabetes, they track each other. They are so close to the, each other that they try to track each other. And transition from normal tension to hypertension is characterized by a sharp increase in blood pressure. Patient was not hypertensive a month back and suddenly he comes to you with a blood pressure of 180 by 110 the next visit. And the commonest cause in both is insulin resistance. And if you look at the complications, be it macro or micro, both are very common in diabetes and hypertension. But 75% of the added cardiovascular risk is because of hypertension. We know that mortality or cardiovascular risk events increase with a rise in blood pressure. But even at every same level of blood pressure, a patient with diabetes will have much more cardiovascular event as compared to one who does not have diabetes. So what is the connection between diabetes and hypertension? Fat. Everybody has been talking about fat since morning. We know we have a lot of visceral adiposity, increased visceral fat stores in the body. That leads to increased portal free fatty acids, decrease in the hepatic insulin clearance, hyperinsulinemia, increased renal sodium absorption, and hypertension. On the other hand, the angiotensogenogen that stimulates into angiotensin 2 from angiotensin 1, vascular constriction, and hypertension. So you can now imagine why they have a sinister alliance. Now, Dr. Zargar was talking about how his DMs measure the blood pressure. But the fact is, recently there was news that more than 60% doctors, so called the students were failed in MD examination because they could not measure blood pressure properly. That is the status today. <coughs> Everybody will talk about, show you this slide when talking about hypertension. Everybody looks at it, but hardly anybody follows. And remember, friends, look at the variations, the wide variations and very significant variations in blood pressure if you do not know how to measure blood pressure properly. <clears throat> so before you treat it, you have to measure blood pressure properly. And then you have to define it. What do you mean by definition? We you know diastolic hypertension T dominates before the age of 50, systolic later on, <clears throat> and systolic hypertension increases with age, and it represents the most common form of hypertension in patients with diabetes. Whereas, before the age of 50, diastolic blood pressure is a potent uh, uh, cardiovascular risk factor. After the age of 50, it is systolic. <coughs> and the, it is very easy to control diastolic blood pressure, but systolic, isolate, especially isolated systolic blood pressure, is one of the most challenging diseases to treat. And, and here is this three-fourth of the Primary care physicians don't bother 
इवन इफ द ब्लड प्रेशर शूट्स अप टू वन फिफ्टी बाई हंड्रेड दे से ठीक हो जाएगा डोंट वरी विल देर नो सेंस इन स्टार्टिंग ट्रीटमेंट अगेन विथ एवरी राइज इन ब्लड प्रेशर थीवी मोर्टैलिटी रिज डबल्स विद अ राइज ऑफ ट्वेंटी बाई टेन एंड दिस इज मोर सिग्निफिकेंट इन पेशेंट्स विद डायबिटीज सो टू गिव यू द की मैसेज सिस्टोलिक ब्लड प्रेशर is a stronger predictor of risk than diastolic blood pressure as far as the cardiovascular disease is concerned as far as diabetic nephropathy is concerned and 65% of the patients with diabetes have isolated systolic hypertension which is more difficult to control <coughs> sorry so it's not only predominantly systolic hypertension but non dipper hypertension is also more frequent and we know non dipers also carry a high cv risk <coughs> again we should measure blood pressure at every clinical visit now if the blood pressure is more than 140 by 90 you need to measure it two three times again to confirm hypertension the canadian guidelines say go for an ambulatory bp monitoring before you diagnose hypertension but it is not possible in every place the best way is to measure two, two to three times and then also ask the patient to go for home blood pressure monitoring what is important the sustained aspect of hypertension it is not once the blood pressure is and otherwise is normal it is a sustained aspect of hypertension that is more important <coughs> and the criteria for diagnosing hypertension should be differentiated from blood pressure treatment targets so one is threshold where you diagnose hypertension the other is the target that you want to achieve you must look at orthostatic hypertension is very important first time and then whenever you suspect a patient complains of giddiness or something and you know the formula of how to diagnose orthostatic hypertension 20 mm by 10 mm decrease systolic diastolic within 3 minutes of standing and this is associated with increased mortality monitoring it is very important to teach the patient how to go for home blood pressure monitoring and that is will help you in patient treatment and adherence it improves the medication adherence reduces the cardiovascular risk factors and it has been shown that home blood pressure monitoring is as good as the gold standard m24 hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring as far as the cv risk is concerned <coughs> once we have diagnosed hypertension we have sufficient evidence today to show that 10 mm reduction in the blood pressure leads to 13% decrease in the microvascular endpoints 19% decrease in fatal and non fatal stroke 12% decrease in heart failure and 12% decrease in fatal or non fatal mi now this review shows the significant decrease in not only all cause mortality but in the different major adverse cardiovascular events if you get the blood pressure down from to less than 140 by 90 <coughs> if you are controlling blood pressure Uh, you have got a very good glycemic control what happens if you control the blood pressure intensively look at the reductions in stroke end point death and various complications you get a larger benefit so if you are supposed to ask who is the more sinister one it is the hypertension control it first <coughs> and this are this is the, again um, trials which have shown that what is the uh, patient with intensive glycemic control standard glycemic control patients with intensive blood pressure control and the message key message is that cv event risk in patients receiving standard glycemic control was significantly lower in the intensive group versus standard blood pressure group but there was no difference in the intensive glycemic control group so it becomes more important to control blood pressure if you reduce the a1c by 0.9% you reduce the events by about 3 to 4 if you reduce ldl by 1 millimole per liter you reduce the events by almost 8 8 to 9% but when you reduce 
systolic blood pressure by only 4 millimeters of mercury, you reduce the CV events by almost 12.5 events. There are two wonderful meta-analyses that were published in the BMJ in 2016, creating a lot of confusion. One was by Matthias Bernstrom, a systemic review and meta-analysis. 49 tri trials, more than 73,000 patients. They showed that the, the BP is more than 150, systolic BP, and if you reduce it, there is a reduction in all-cause mortality, CV mortality, stroke, and end-stage renal disease. And this is significant. But if you further reduce it to between 140 and 150, this, the benefits are added. But if you reduce it to less than 140, surprisingly, it increased the risk of CV mortality with a tendency towards increase in all-cause mortality. Well, these were very puzzling findings. Should we not go, go below 140? In the next, in the next month, this, another group, Paul S. Mueller, they looked at the meta-analysis and they looked at the patients only who did not have previous cardiovascular disease. And it was almost 187,000 patients. And what did they find? That a systolic blood pressure, 110 to 119, had significantly lower non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, non-fatal CVD, total CVD, and non-fatal CHD. But the risks were higher for heart failure, all-cause death, in that 110 to 120 group. So what does it mean? That the baseline systolic blood pressure of less than 130 confirmed significantly lower risk for adverse CV events than did the systolic of 130 to 139. And it also suggests that the association between the low baseline systolic and all-cause death is not only because of the cardiovascular disease, but the concomitant disease of patient factors that led both to the blood pressure and high risk. The target uh, blood pressure goals, there again has been controversy, but now we are almost arrived at a consensus that the treatment goal should be less than 130 by 80 millimeters of mercury. And it is still shown that in patients with diabetes and elevated cardiovascular risk, even after extensive adjustment for underlying disease burden, there's still a persistent association of low diastolic blood pressure and subclinical myocardial injury. Diabetes with hypertension, very high risk in the spectrum of how you classify or risk stratify hypertension. How low to go? Everybody talks of reducing from one, less than 130 by 80, but how low to go? Systolic less than 110, patients are more likely to die then whose systolic is between 130 to 139, almost 2.8 times. Diastolic less than 74, significantly more likely to die. So the blood pressure of less than 110 by 75 has excess mortality at 3.5 years. So now you know the lower cutoff also. So don't go too low because that is not going to benefit you much. How intensely should we treat isolated systolic blood pressure in older adults? Is it 140, less than 140, less than 150? Again, a lot of controversy. There were a number of trials, cyst euro trial and all that. The message came out was that the CV mortality did not increase with low diastolic blood pressure unless the patient had a heart disease at baseline. So in apparently healthy people, don't bother about diastolic. But in middle-aged and elderly, or those with subclinical heart disease, do not go below 110. That is the intensity. 110 by 70 should be the intensity. And that brings me to the J-curve, the clarified study. We know the, what is the J-curve, more than 140 by 90, high risk. Uh, if you go down to less than 120 by 70, again, increased risk of various ma major, but except for stroke, this was denied by some studies, supported by some studies. Again, the message is that the J-curve is there, but it is applicable to patients with presence of coronary artery disease with hypertension and not to everyone. 
Now, this is a wonderful cautionary note given by Deepak Bhatt. That why are you fighting about the target goals? Let us start treating the patients and getting the blood pressure down from 170, 150, 162, at least 10, 20 systolic down. Even that is going to help you a lot. So, from a population health perspective, more would be gained from maintaining traditional BP targets for the entire population adjusted for age rather than sorting out the nuances of how low to go. So that is a very important thing. Treatment part, lifestyle has been discussed ad nauseum. I will not go into the details. All of you know about it. But what is important? If you follow lifestyle measures, it lowers blood pressure, enhances the effectiveness of some antihypertensive medication, and promotes other aspects of metabolic and vascular health, less adverse effects, and can prevent or delay the diagnosis of hypertension and need for pharmacological therapy. And it was been very nicely stressed by Parimal today. Drug treatments. The, today the recommendation is a RAS blocker along with a calcium channel blocker or a direct thiazide diuretics. Do not use two RAS blockers like AC and AR based together. And in the absence of albuminuria, the risk of progressive kidney disease is low. So RAS blockers have not been found to be superior. In fact, the ARBs reduce or suppress the development of albuminuria, but increase the rate of a cardiovascular event. And they did not prevent the development of diabetic glomopathy assessed by kidney biopsy. So RAS inhibitors are not recommended for patients without hypertension in, in patients of normal albuminuria to prevent kidney disease. Hypertension treatment for patients without albuminuria, you can use any of the drugs, preferable to use single uh, pill combination. Hazard like diuretics act very well till a GFR of 30, below 30 use loop diuretics. And this is the latest recommendations given by the International Society of Hypertension. Start low with a combination of uh, RAS blocker with CCB or thiazide, gradually up titrate, use single pill combination, use thiazide diuretics preferably. So friends, the take home message, diabetes and hypertension forms a sinister alliance. And remember, as I have shown you, that hypertension is a very strong modifiable risk factor, both for micro and microvascular complication. So the focus should be on achieving blood pressure goal and managing concomitant disease burden, total blood pressure burden early and aggressive management with a single pill combination therapy. Home monitoring of blood pressure is going to become routine just like SMBG. Diagnostic cutoffs of, cut of BP are, will always remain controversial. In the age of precision medicine, when we are sequencing genes to personalize medical care, something as simple as one blood pressure for all is totally illogical and bizarre. Target blood pressure is less than 130 by 80. You can achieve lower if the patient can tolerate. Ideally, keep systolic between 110 to 130 and diastolic between 70 to 80. Having said that, remember, treatment has to be individualized to the specific patient based on their comorbidities, their anticipated benefit of reduction of the CV risk, heart failure, kidney disease, retinopathy, and other is for adverse events. And this should be of shared decision making with the patient. Friends, I will leave you with a beautiful image. This is a very rare photograph I'm going to show you, which was taken half a second before this tsunami hit this coastal town and totally devastated it. That, my friends, is diabetes and hypertension together waiting to devastate our lives. Thank you.